one of the most important Kentucky founders, and he's buried right here on the edge of a cornfield. Hey everybody, this is Colonel Carson with Family Tree Nuts, and I'm in Logan Cemetery in Shelby County, Kentucky. I'm at the graveside of General Benjamin Logan. Now, I'll start off by telling you how to get here. Take I-64 and take exit 32. Go about a half of a mile south on Route 55. At the historic marker, turn right on Brunnertown Road. Go about two and a half miles and on the left, there's a driveway right before you go down the hill. Turn in there. If you get to a bridge, you've went too far. There's a house there, so you better let them know you're here. Follow in between cornfield and the line, about a half a mile. And eventually, you'll reach this beautiful cemetery. It's well worth it. It's amazing that a man with such importance to our history is buried in an unassuming graveyard in the middle of nowhere. And by the way, if you like our videos, make sure you subscribe to our free YouTube channel and click that little bell so you get notifications as to when we post new videos. Now back to General Logan. So who is General Benjamin Logan? Benjamin Logan was born in 1742 in Augusta County, Virginia. He married Anne Montgomery. Now her sister married Colonel William Casey, the guy that Casey County's named after. And actually, they're the great-grandparents of Samuel Clemens. You might know him as Mark Twain. But anyway, back to General Logan. His first act in his formative life is he served with the Virginia Militia and Henry Beaucourt's campaign against the Shawnee in 1764. In 1774, he served with many notable frontiersmen as a lieutenant in Lord Dunmore's war. And then in May of 1775, just a few weeks after Daniel Boone took his axemen to build Boonesboro, Benjamin and his John Floyd separated from their path at Hazel Patch and went further west. They named their settlement St. Asaph because John Floyd was a Welshman and St. Asaph is the patron saint of Wales. And they arrived at the location on St. Asaph Day. At St. Asaph, Logan built a cabin and planted corn which was one of Virginia's requirements for claiming land. He then returned to Virginia for the winter. The next year, in 1776, he returned to St. Asset with his wife Jane and his son David and his slave Molly and their three sons, Matt, Dave, and Isaac. Work was started on his fort and it was finished in 1777. The fort was only about 90 feet by 150 feet Folks, that's only about a third of the size of a football field. Logan was appointed Sheriff and Justice of the Peace, and he was made second in command of the militia of Kentucky County, Virginia. Now, as you know, during this time, there was a tremendous amount of Native American attacks in the area. Logan sent his family to Fort Herod for safety. Now, the fort did withstand an epic siege on May the 30th of 1777. The natives felt like the fort couldn't be conquered, so they gave it the name of Standing Fort. Soon, a town grew up all around the fort, and they named it Stanford for Standing Fort. Perhaps you've heard of the town of Stanford in Lincoln County, Kentucky. In 1778, Daniel Boone was brought to the fort and tried for treason. Earlier in February of that year, Daniel was in charge of a group of men that were making salt at Blue Licks. Shawnee Braves captured Daniel, and he convinced them to not kill all the men that were making the salt. Daniel worked out a deal with the Shawnee that if they surrendered peaceably, they would not be killed, and none of the men except him would have to run a gauntlet. Some of the men were adopted into Shawnee families, and others were taken as prisoners to Fort Detroit. Daniel was one of the men that was adopted by the Chief Blackfish. Now, over the next few months, Daniel earned the Shawnee's trust, and he was allowed to carry a rifle and hunt in the area. He began to hear talk of the Shawnee's planned attack on Fort Boonesboro. His family was there. As soon as Daniel got the opportunity, he ran away from the Shawnee and went to Fort Boonesboro. Now, there's different accounts. 
Some say it was 120 miles. Some say it was 160 miles. Some say it was four days. Some say it was five days. But either way, it was well over 100 miles in four days that he ran to warn his friends at Fort Boonesboro. Do you think you could do that today, 120 miles in four days? That kind of shows you the physical fitness of our pioneer ancestors. When Daniel arrived at the fort, he was dressed and looked like a Shawnee himself. Many of the men thought that he had sold out the men so that they could be captured by the Shawnee. It is that Daniel actually led a war party into Ohio to a village to prove his innocence. But that village was almost vacant and the men realized that they'd better get back to Boonesboro before the attack came from Chief Blackfish. Some believe that Daniel was trying to weaken the fort by leading men into Ohio. After the Shawnees unsuccessful attempt to destroy Fort Boonesboro, Daniel was brought to Fort Logan for his trial. Daniel convinced the jury of his innocence and he was pardoned from all charges. However, Daniel was aggravated to be charged by his friends of treason in the first place and he soon led his family out of the fort and established Boone Station in 1779. Also in 1779, the hated British Henry the Hair Buyer Hamilton was brought to Logan's Fort. General George Rogers Clark had captured Hamilton at Vincennes. Hamilton was being sent for imprisonment back east, so he made a stop at Fort Logan. Now, Henry the Hair Buyer Harrison was one of the most hated men on the frontier. He earned the nickname of Hair Buyer because he would pay the Native Americans for white scalps. He also would pay them even more for white captives. This was one of the British's tactics to weaken the American frontier. Finally, in October of 1799, Virginia opened their first land office and Logan was granted 400 acres. Now, for the last few years, court had been held in Kentucky at Fort Herod, but in 1781, Benjamin Logan donated land for an official courthouse. Now, in order to have a courthouse, you had to have three things. One of them was a physical building for the courthouse. One of them was a tavern. And the third thing was a jail. I find it interesting that a courthouse, a tavern, and a jail are the three requirements. Politics, booze, and jail kind of all goes together, even today, doesn't it? In 1786, the courthouse was removed from the fort and moved to the town of Stanford. This is the first mention of the town of Stanford. During the Revolutionary War, Ben Logan served under George Rogers Clark on raids north of the Ohio River on Native American camps. Logan was elected to the Virginia House of Delegates and served between 1781 and 1787. During this time, he was one of the leading voices pushing for statehood of Kentucky. Kentucky had continually been harassed and attacked and raided by Native American tribes. They destroyed crops and homes and killed and captured many pioneers. So in October of 1786, Logan led a force of Kentucky Mounted Militia to attack Shawnee towns in Ohio on the Little Miami River and the Mad River. This campaign was called Logan's Raid. Logan's Raid attacked and burned 13 villages that were lightly defended because most of the warriors were off to fight George Rogers Clark, who was attacking along the Wabash River settlements. Logan ordered his men to not kill any Shawnee who surrendered. Logan's men captured the 94-year-old Shawnee Chief Malantha. It is said that Chief Malantha surrendered in front of his wigiwa, holding a United States flag and a treaty of Fort Finney, which was signed the year before. Men were left to guard Chief Malantha, and the old chief took out his pipe and was actually smoking with the guards for a while. And then something horrific happened. Captain Hugh McGarry came up to the men. He used his rank to force himself to get to Chief Malantha. Now, Captain McGarry is the same Scots-Irish hothead that a few years earlier at the Battle of Blue Licks led that foolish charge up the ridge. The Kentucky militia, to include Daniel Boone, 
were gathered on the other side of the river and trying to figure out should they attack the ridge or hold back. Captain McGarry plunged his horse into the Licking River and said, any man that ain't cowards, come with me. And the Kentucky militia ran across the river, up the ridge and to an ambush. It was one of the worst defeats on the frontier. This tarnished McGarry's name for many years. McGarry walked up to Chief Melantha and asked him had he been at the Battle of Blue Licks. Chief Melantha didn't understand what he said and said that he was there at the battle. It is said that McGarry said, God damn it, here's some payback, and murdered Chief Melantha with his tomahawk and scalped him. Benjamin Logan relieved McGarry of his command and court-martialed him. The result of the court-martial was that McGarry was not allowed to lead troops for a year. This infuriated the Shawnee, and their attacks on Kentucky doubled. Once again, McGarry was responsible for pioneer deaths. Now, it must be brought up that Hugh McGarry is a complicated person, and he had lots of reasons for his actions. But that's a story for another day. Back to General Logan. Logan eventually moved here to Shelby County, where he served in the Kentucky House of Representatives from 1792 until 1795. He twice ran unsuccessfully for governor in 1796 and 1800. General Benjamin Logan died of a stroke in 1802 at his home near Shelbyville and is buried right here. Also buried in this cemetery is Colonel James Knox. Colonel Knox was born in Northern Ireland around 1740, and there's some disputes as to when he came to the United States. He might have been 14, and he might have been as young as four. In 1770, five years before settlement, he led a team of 40 long hunters into Kentucky. Colonel Knox and nine other men established a camp that they called Fort Knox in modern day Greene County, Kentucky. This is not the same Fort Knox that has the gold. After a year in the wilderness, the men returned back to Virginia in 1771. Knox served as a representative of Kentucky County and the Virginia Assembly in 1788. And he was a Kentucky State Senator from 1795 until 1800. After Benjamin Logan's passing in 1802, Colonel Knox married Logan's widow. Colonel Knox died in 1822, and he's buried right here in Logan Cemetery. Like so many other pioneer cemeteries, Logan Cemetery has a dilapidated stone fence. Buried here are several members of the Logan family. and many of their friends. Interestingly, just to the side of the rock wall are a couple of graves. And behind the rock wall is the grave of who we think is one of Benjamin Logan's sons. It's a beautiful and peaceful final resting place for all these people that are buried here. What an amazing life that General Benjamin Logan had. For decades, he fought against the Shawnee and other Native American tribes. He's one of the first settlers of Kentucky, and he helped establish the government of Kentucky. It can be said with confidence that General Benjamin Logan is one of the most important founding fathers to Kentucky, but sadly, he's mostly forgotten today. Even his eternal resting place is largely unknown. But here at Family Tree Nuts, we are honored to keep General Benjamin Logan's memory and legacy alive. And remember, Family Tree Nuts, let our nuts find the nuts in your family tree.